anything that's every day is a significant percentage of your life. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. One of the things I tell people when they're trying to develop a vision for their life or an implemental plan is um, make a bad plan. Make the best one you can, but don't get obsessive about it. It's like make a plan, implement it. You'll figure out when you implement it why it's stupid exactly, and then you can fix it a little bit, and then you can fix it a bit more, and then you can fix it a bit more. I don't think that I've ever been in a situation where if something wasn't going right for me and I sat and thought, okay, uh, all right, I'm willing to figure out what I'm doing wrong, which is a big thing to think because you never know how much you're doing wrong. It might be something that you really don't want to contend with, but if you clear some space to meditate on that, the probability that you'll figure out something that you did that was stupid, that's bending you and twisting you in the wind, you'll, you'll get an answer very, very rapidly. The answer to how you pay for your past sins isn't by jumping off a bridge. Well, how much do you need to be beat up? Enough so you fix the problem. No more than that. Minimal yeah. necessary force. Don't hit anything harder than it needs to be hit. That's a good rule of thumb. Is there something I can do now to atone for what I failed to do in the past? So let's say you go over your past with a fine-tooth comb and you decide you're going to take responsibility for everything that you did that was wrong and everything that you failed to do that you could have done that was right. Like, does that change the world? It's like, depends on how thoroughly you do it. You might say it changes the world like nothing else possibly can. And I think that that's actually right. And that's also a frightening thought because it means that things would be way better than they are if you weren't so damn useless. There's this unlimited power that's associated with genius, but it's constrained. And that's really what the human spirit is like, because it has this aspect of the infinite. When you don't get what you want, then a landscape of questions emerge. And those questions can resonate through different levels of your identity, from the trivial, oh, I told the joke wrong, to the profound. There's nothing desirable about me and I'll be alone for the rest of my life. It's daunting to even consider that. And then there's the discipline and responsibility that that necessitates, which is also daunting. It's like, oh my God, the problem's that serious. I'm really going to have to get my act together in order to not contribute to it, much less solve it. And so the problem is terrible. And then the, the solution is daunting. When I commit to something and make sacrifices, you know, if something's valuable, you'll make sacrifices to attain it. And, that discovery of sacrifice, it's one of the f- primary factors separating human beings from animals. Because we discovered that we could let go of something we value in the present, and we would gain something we value even more in the future. you got to aim at something. It's like, otherwise your life is meaningless. Well, what should you aim at? Well, I don't know. Well, pick something. Aim at it. As you move toward it, you'll get wiser. Then maybe your aim will change. That's okay. But at least it'll change in an informed way. It's like discipline yourself in one dimension. See what happens. Well, that's exciting. Always take into account the cost of what you're doing now. Right? Because what people tend to think is, well, what I'm ever, whatever I'm doing now is risk-free. And here's a bunch of options. It's like, no. Whatever you're doing right now has all sorts of risks. You're just, you're just blind to them because you've habituated to them. They've become invisible. You can't wait around to make things better on the assumption that what you're doing already is without risk. So when people come to see me clinically, for example, and maybe I'm helping them figure out what to do with their career. So they say, well, I think I might need to change jobs. It's like, okay, what's stopping you? Well, there's lots of things, right? Well, I have a job. That's something. Mm -hmm. It offers me some, some security. My CV isn't up to date. People don't like updating their CVs. It's partly because it's hard, but also because they're not, very proud of it. So then updating your CV turns into sort of updating your life and that's a complicated thing. And then maybe you don't like being interviewed because most people don't and maybe you don't like being judged. And maybe you don't like the fact that if you look for another job, there'll be 50 rejections for every one acceptance. It's like there's a whole plethora of terrible things you have to encounter if you want to change jobs. So you think, well, I'm not going to do that. The risk is too high. It's like, fair enough. What's the risk of doing what you're doing? That's easy. You don't like it? Guaranteed suffering. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. And accelerating suffering. Yeah. Because let's say you're 35 now and you don't change your job. Well, you'll be 40 so fast you can't even believe it. It'll just happen. Like it'll take five years. But it happens oh, It happens overnight at this, in the same way. And if you haven't changed, then you'll be the same except worse. So that's the alternative. If 
you're not if you're not if you don't find what you're doing sufficiently productive or responsible or meaningful or engaging or all of that it's like well there's a big risk in changing it it's like yeah there is in our phenomenological landscape so that's the world as we experience it complete with emotions and motivations and dreams and so the full range of human experience including the subjective and the objective let's say can broadly be broken into two domains and one is the domain of things that are beyond our grasp and reach and that's the unknown the unknown emerges when the unknown emerges you tend to experience anxiety and then there's the the known and i define the known very specifically and, and very carefully the known is the place you are when what you're doing result produces the results you want and i say want because that brings motivation and emotion into the game so you're motivated to pursue something you pursue it and what you want happens not only do you get what you want but you get validation for the structure that governs your perceptions and your actions you know there's lots of different ways to interpret the world and you can maybe even make a case that there's an endless number of ways to interpret the world and the problem with that is that it kind of disorients you in terms of what you should be doing but just because there's a very large number of ways to interpret the world doesn't mean there's a very large number of pro- productive meaningful and sustainable ways to interpret the world and one of the things you do have to do is figure out how you can conduct yourself today so that you don't upset the apple cart in a week or a month or a year right because you're playing an iterating game one of the things i often tell my clients and this is a really useful thing to know too there's a lot of emphasis in the new testament especially in the sermon on the mount on paying attention to the day the thing that's so interesting about the day the day is like a page in a book of course there's many pages in a book but the page repeats and so i had one client who was spending about 45 minutes a night fighting with his young son about when to go to bed. And so, you know, they weren't having a pleasant time of it because it was just a constant battle. And so we did some arithmetic. It's like, okay, 40 minutes a day. So that's 280 minutes a week, so that's like say 5 hours. It's 20 hours a month, or it's 240 hours in a year. That's 6 work weeks. That's a month and a half. You're spending a month and a half of work weeks doing nothing but fighting with your son. What makes you think you're going to like him? <laughs> Right? Well, and you know, it's it's it, you think, well, it's only 40 minutes a day. It's like don't don't fool yourself. You're awake, let's say 16 hours. Five of those hours are basically maintenance. So you got about 11, and then seven of those are work. So now you're down to four. And so if you're spending 15 minutes a day doing something painful and stupid and you do it every day, it's like 10% of your productive life. Yeah. And so it's really useful to to get because people think backwards. They think, well, I have a vacation coming up and that's really important. It's like no it's not. You're only going to do it once. It's not that important. Yeah. Um how you treat each other at lunchtime if you eat together every day, that's your life. Yeah. Fix that. Yeah. Get it get it so that the food's good. Get it so that you're happy with the people that are sitting there. Fix that. It's like poof, 10% of your life is fixed.